Reading from the 18th proverb, from the authorized version of the scriptures. Please, join me today. Join me in reading the scripture. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures, the King James Version. Please, follow me along in the scriptures that we are going to be looking at today. Follow me along, word for word, verse by verse, at the scripture we are going to be looking at today. Follow me along as we read together. Follow me along. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. And if I skip a groove, let me know. Please, please, don't take my word for anything I tell you. Search the scriptures with me. Come on. If you have a question about something, got a couple of emails to get a hold of me. It might take a little while. <laughs> because for a nobody like myself, oh, wow. Check me out. Check me out. Come on. We're going to be talking about a very sensitive subject today. I want us to begin. Today is the 18th. Have you read the 18th proverb today? Have you mused upon it? Or did you just read it to read it? Proverbs 18. Just two verses we're going to look at. Verse 2. A fool. A fool says in his heart there is no God. Hath no delight in understanding departing from evil. But that his heart may discover itself. And you're a fool if you trust in your own heart. <laughs> Only a fool. Someone who says in his heart there is no God. Trust in his own heart. You hear so many people say, follow your heart. Go with what your heart tells you. God knows my heart. <laughs> Verse 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Oh, and that happened a lot. That has been happening a whole lot with the comments still to this day that are popping up on that video the Lord had me to do uh, refuting that wicked devil, uh, Mark the Mess. Uh, people are not watching the video. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's obvious. It's obvious. But uh, yes, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Here's what we're going to be talking about today. I really don't know what to call this video. That will, that's a minor issue. People, when it comes to your, me personally, say that, Brad, you say that Jesus is a sinner. No, sir. No, sir. I have never said that, never taught that. But, you teach that the flesh that Jesus Christ is come in was capable of sin. No, sir. No, sir. That's what the Scripture teaches. Okay? That's what the Scripture teaches. That flesh is unprofitable. That nothing good dwells within the actual physical flesh. Okay? That, that's what the Scripture teaches. But see, now here's the argument. And this was one of the um, argumentative, almost accusations that I received from a psychopath before. <laughs> um, here's, here's what the question is. Brett, if you say the flesh that Jesus Christ is come in, God manifest in the flesh, was capable of sin, was sinful, then that must mean that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross was not effective, right? That's the accusation. No, sir. 
No, sir. No, no, not at all. See, therein, therein lies your problem. My problem? Yeah. Here, therein lies your problem. What's your problem? You want to know what your problem is? I'm happy to tell you. Oh, I'm being prideful, huh? That ghost get a haircut yet, buddy? Problem, uh, Psalm 50. You want to know what your problem is? Verse 21. We're going to be looking at this here, I believe, within these notes here a little later. But this is what your, this is what your problem is. Psalm 50, verse 21. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set thee them in order before thine eyes. When the Roman Catholic Church was established centuries ago, very, very early on, the very first doctrine that Catholicism went forth to teach, um, I, I used to have a book, uh, several books documenting this, but I got rid of them. But you don't believe a word I said. Check me out. Go back way, way back. And you can still find this information online. Uh, go way, way back to the early church fathers of the Roman Catholic Church. That was the very first doctrine that they started to push. That God was three persons. That three persons make one God. Okay? That's what they began. That's that was what they came out of the gate with. That was the thing that they pushed immediately. That one God was made up of three persons. And here's the interesting thing. When atheists or even Muslims or any other out there say, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. One God comprised of three persons. But it's one God. Wait, wait a minute. And then they, they come up with well, like, uh, well, the, the, the Trinity was made to confuse you. God is not the author of confusion. Okay. Okay. And then there's this one channel, uh, what was it, Acts 17, Apologia or something like that. A disciple of Jesuit James White. Um, uh, this, this guy tried to explain the Trinity and he came up with this nonsensical one plus one plus one plus one equal the guy may have befooled himself made a total uh, imbecile of himself trying to explain the Trinity well that's the mystery of godliness the Trinity is satanic the Trinity is satanic absolutely satanic it is the core doctrine that Roman Catholicism, from its inception, began to promulgate, to put forth. Don't, hey, check me out on that. The history speaks for itself. Okay? And cultures, Christendom, Christianity, has been brought up in this erroneous, heretical idea of one God is made of three persons. One God. Three persons. But we don't worship three gods. We worship one God. And a person, as defined by Scripture, ouch, is a spirit, soul, and body. And yet the Trinitarian says that we don't worship three gods. Atheists can figure it. Wait, yeah, you do. Muslims, yeah, yeah. You want to turn you want to turn a Muslim's world upside down when you're talking to him. Two two things. I'm not a Christian. I'm of the Church of the Living God. Number one. Number two. Yeah, the Trinity is of the devil. I speak from experience. That will open up the doors for communication and make for you for an effectual witnessing opportunity with a son 
or daughter of Ishmael. Try it. Try it. Okay? Hence, when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus, the Trinitarian who believes in three gods says, well, that's, that's simple. God the Son. He was the one who crucified, who was crucified and died. So, a third of God died on the cross. And here's another thing. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? That, that's profound, but it's that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? And there are those out there who do not understand, and you know what? For those, can't blame them. Who think that flesh, flesh, is God. <laughs> Excuse me. Flesh is God. God was manifest in the flesh. Okay? But there are those out there because of what Catholicism has done. They worship this. Flesh. They say that flesh is God. They say that flesh is God. What's that the scripture? And see, people who don't understand the simplicity that Scripture teaches God was manifest in the flesh. John chapter 1. Now, there is a video on the channel, a very popular video, um, which is called The Worship of the Skin Suit, where we talk about this. That will be in the description box if you have any questions. Uh, if you are a Jesuit coadjutor who worships flesh and is not saved to begin with, hey, buddy, um, shut up, go away. You're not going to listen? You're not going to uh, hear what um, is going to be said to you today? Then go away. Go away. Light up another cigarette and drink another beer and cough yourself to death. Okay? About time anyway. But anyway, John chapter 1. Now we're not going to get extraordinarily deep into this because we don't have to. Uh, there is a video. Uh, Worship of the skin suit, which will be in the description box. Uh, it's funny, because a lot of these King James Bible-believing Christians who lick the foot of his, their one who they worship as God, uh, they themselves who claim to be saved and, you know, call other people lost, uh, These some of them don't even get this. Go figure. But, John chapter 1. Follow, follow me along. Come on. Follow me along. Okay. John chapter 1, verses 1 under verse 14. Okay? Come on, follow me along. In the beginning was the flesh, and the flesh was with God, and the flesh was God. <laughs> Oops. In the beginning was the capital W word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Not past tense, just acknowledging that, yes, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, by the way, the name Jesus. Jehovah saves. Christ, the Anointed One. The Mashiach, the Anointed One. Jehovah saves, the Anointed One. Okay? Okay? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Now hold your place here and go to Genesis chapter 1. Seeing the Godhead in action. In the very first three verses of Scripture. In the beginning. Genesis, the beginning. Chapter 1, verses 1 and on to verse 3. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, spoke, the Word, capital W, made flesh. Okay? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
So, let's go back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the capital W Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jehos put A in there, was a God. But capital W Word, seven times. In the authorized version of the scriptures, seven times. Here's the capital W Word, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, who is come in the flesh. Okay? Okay, you with me so far? All right? Okay? Uh, the Bibles take out 1 John 5, 7, and they call it the Johannian comma. So then capital W in the Bibles only appears six times. Okay? Let's keep reading in John chapter 4. John chapter 1. Verse 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that capital L light, but was sent to bear witness of that capital L light. Capital L light, also referring on to Jesus Christ. That was the true capital L light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, capital L light here only appears four times. There may be another incident at the beginning of a verse, you know, capitalizing the beginning of a verse as, as you search the scripture. Every verse that begins is with a capital letter. So there may be another incident where light is the beginning of, of a verse. But within this context, the four times of capital L light also is referring on to our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Yes, because there was no beauty in him that the world would behold or would want him. That's talked about in Isaiah chapter 53, which we will be looking at today. Okay? Yes. And see, they're in Satan. Satan. Read Ezekiel chapter 28. Satan was adorned with every precious stone and covering. Oh, for me. Okay? Thank you, pardon Oh, brother dear, <laughs> wait till you see, uh... <laughs> amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Anyway, as we were talking about, I, I forgot to tell I love you, brother, but I had, you know. Anyway, yes, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not, because there was no beauty in him that uh, people wanted to behold him. The son of carpenter, okay? Physically, in appearance, our Lord Jesus Christ, that much to look at physically and see what does Roman Catholicism do oh they make this beautiful effeminate looking Jesus who looks so beautiful some out there said Brad that's blasphemy to say that Jesus was not that much to look at while in the flesh that's what the scripture te uh, teaches us and we're going to look at that here in a little later but see Satan who had every precious stone as his covering and was blinded by the brightness of that covering his precious stones. Oh, Satan is made to look so beautiful. So beautiful. Why? Because Satan savoreth the things that be of man, not of God. His curse was he was to curse to go upon his belly. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. And he dust all the days of his life. And man is dust, is he not? Okay? So world knew him not because there was no beauty in him okay but Satan on the other hand oh he looks so beautiful doesn't he doesn't he look online he came unto his own the Jews and his own received him not two distinctions the world everyone in common and his own the Jews okay verse 12 but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And here verse 14. And the Word, capital W, was made flesh. Okay, the Word. 
was made flesh. Okay? The Word was made flesh. In the Old Testament, when you see God appearing in a bodily form, the Word was made flesh. Okay, this is in the New Testament. Okay? This is when the Word was birthed through Mary. Okay? All right? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? But in the Old Testament, okay? Yes, God has a body. Absolutely He does. But see, this is when God was born of woman. Okay? Meaning, uh, the seed. God's seed. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. And she was with child of the Holy Ghost. There was no physicalities there, like the Mormons teach. Okay? That's what the Mormons teach. Alright? And Mary birthed the body, the Word, that was made flesh. She birthed the physical body, not the Word Himself. Not the Word. Okay? Alright? Not God Himself. Alright? But the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay? Alright, are you with me so far? Alright, now let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Okay? Romans chapter 8. Verses 1 under verse 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, right here, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So verse 3 tells us that the flesh that the Word was man was come in, okay, uh, that God was manifest in, verse 3 tells us that that flesh in and of itself was sinful. That the flesh itself was capable of sin. The temptation that Satan gave unto the Lord, okay? God cannot be tempted with evil. What can be tempted with evil? Flesh. Flesh can. God within that flesh cannot be tempted with evil. Okay? But the flesh that God was in, the flesh itself, can be tempted. Uh, any of you who have been alive for more than, oh, 20 years, you have realized that the flesh itself has basically its own mind. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 7. Okay? You have already figured that out, haven't you? Hey, hey, you scum Jesuit coadjutors, you know, light up a cigarette there, pal, drink your beer at the pub, okay? You yourselves have to admit that your flesh seems to have a mind of its own, doesn't it? Yes. Why? Because all flesh is sinful, capable of sin. Okay? All right? So was God born a sinner? No. No. Because if he was born a sinner, then he would have to be redeemed, wouldn't he? God is perfect. God cannot sin. But God himself, the Godhead, which is spirit, soul, and body. Okay, you know John, 1 John 5, 7, which the Bibles take out? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? It's not that hard to figure out. All right? But see, God is perfect. God cannot sin. God who cannot sin was born into a body that could sin. God within that body cannot sin. Okay? You know how you, if you are saved, born again, converted, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost, sealed unto the day of redemption, right? Okay, you got that? The Holy Ghost that is in you cannot sin, okay? But guess what? We as man, we are not God. The Holy Ghost in John chapter 4, I believe it is, talks about that, okay? Okay, his seed remaineth in him, talking about the Holy Ghost, okay? The Holy Ghost within you cannot sin and will not guide you unto sin. But guess what? 
we are within the flesh. Hence, we will sin because we are not God. But God within us cannot sin. God within us will guide us on into all truth. But we sin. God could not sin. It's not that hard to figure out. Okay? Now verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And of course, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay? Alright? Now, go to Genesis chapter 22. Okay? Genesis chapter 22. One verse. Okay? Those of you of the Church of the Living God, not Christians, you ought to know what this is, uh, for, uh, is about. Genesis chapter 22, just one verse. Just one verse. Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now, the Bibles totally messed this up. Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, again, slowly. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself, himself, a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. So God will provide himself. The Godhead is spirit, soul, and body. And these three are one. Not three persons... Three gods that make one God. That is insanity. These scriptures does not teach that. Okay? That is that, dear friend. The Trinity is blasphemy. But don't worry. You Christians that are going to go through the time of... Uh, excuse me. You Christians that are going to be going through the Great Tribulation, you'll see your Trinity on earth during that time of Jacob's trouble. And it's going to be the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Okay? So you'll get to see your little satanic trinity. Okay? Now, go to 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter... Is that a 1 or a 3? <laughs> uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Okay? Come on, fingers. 1 Peter chapter 1, is it? Uh, one second. Okay, yes, it is chapter 1, because I wrote here a 3, and then I put a line through it. So, 1 Peter chapter 1, chapter uh, verses 21 on to the close of the chapter. Who by him do believe. Uh, let's read verse 20. Uh, actually, let's read verses 18 on to verse 25. Very familiar verses. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Okay? The flesh is sinful, the flesh is weak, but God within that flesh could not sin. Okay? And God manifests in the flesh, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, never ever once sinned. And I have never, you heretics, you lying dogs who go to your vomit, I have never said that Jesus Christ sinned. He could not sin. It was the flesh that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The flesh itself was capable of sin. God cannot sin. There is no spot or blemish within Jesus Christ. He could not sin. Flesh could, but God within that flesh could not. Similar unto us, okay? God who dwells within us, that seal until the day of redemption, um, He cannot sin. The Holy Ghost within us cannot sin. Who is And who is the Holy Ghost? Jesus Christ. One God. Okay? One God. And the Lord is that Spirit. The Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is our Father. One God. Okay? Is within us. Okay? He cannot sin. That's what? We are fallible man. 
We are the creation, not the creator. You see, so many of you think that you are. There lies the rub. Okay? Verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him from raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye the seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, capital S, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the lowercase, by the word of God, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, okay, which liveth and abideth forever, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word, lowercase w, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Okay? Okay? Now go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. There was no blemish. There was no spot in Jesus Christ. Okay? The temptation that was leveled at the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, was aimed at the flesh. You look, you examine the temptations of Jesus Christ. They were all aimed at fleshly things. All of them. Because that was what? The only thing that Satan can tempt. It's your flesh. That's it. That's it. Okay? Well, he can tempt your mind. But see, yes he can. But we have the mind of Christ. See, the Holy Ghost within you, if you are truly saved, will not lead you or guide you into sin. Okay? you got to remember too, it's not at gunpoint. point. Okay? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 on to verse 10. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrificing and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Okay? In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sins, thou hast had no uh, pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above what he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Okay? Alright, are you with me so far? And on this, on this, okay, by the way, what is being quoted here is... Psalm 40. Go to Psalm 40. Okay? Psalm 40. Check scripture with scripture. This is what is being quoted here. Psalm 40. Verses 4 on to verse 10 also. Okay? Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us words. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is written, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the con great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest. It's describing a body. Is it not? Okay. Yes. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. And notice here, go back to Hebrews, where it says, 
Oh, where was that? Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Old Testament sacrifices for sins covered sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ, not the flesh itself, but the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanseth away sin. What, why was that so significant about, um, about you know, why couldn't the blood of bulls and goats? Very simple answer. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And Paul talks about this. By man, man, came death and sin into the world. Adam. By man, God, as man. The man, Christ Jesus, okay? By man came redemption, forgiveness of sin. Yes, God within man. Salvation is of God, you wicked devil heretics who rest people's words, okay? Salvation is of, is of the Jews, and it is God's grace to our faith. But God in man, as man, died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 36 minutes in, you heretics who rest words, you're going to twist that. The Lord rebuke you, you scoundrel, scumbag devils. Go to hell already, would you? Okay? Oh, Brad, you know, brethren, forgive me. There are those out there who have made their choice no matter what anyone would do, even if Jesus Christ himself were to appear to these devils, they would not be saved. They're lost. They've made the, their choice. They are our enemies, okay? And we are not to show any kindness or love toward them. They are the enemies of Christ. Hence, go away. Go to hell already, okay? But, simple. Why, why, why here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins? Very simple. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? The spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. Man became a living soul. Man, man is made in the image of God. We have a spirit, soul, and body. Animals. Know your pets that you love so much, your pets who become, who you make into people. <laughs> there was some young man who said, I bet my salvation that I'll see my little fluffy, he didn't say that, my pet in heaven. Eh, well, it, it is your soul, isn't it? Because you're not saved. It's not your salvation. It's God's gift by grace through faith. But animals, dear friends, They don't have a soul. Animals do not have a soul. Animals have a body and a spirit, but animals do not have souls. If you have children who are watching this and they they got their beautiful, cute little pet dog, I'm sorry. You have a little tragedy on your hands eventually, and I'm sorry to say it so bluntly. But, uh, yes, animals do not have a soul. So, see, their blood could only cover, not do away with. You see? Okay? And also go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 now. Okay? Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We want verses 18 on to verse 20. Okay? Here's, a, here's another more another thing about, you know, why the blood of bulls of goats couldn't take away sin. Okay? Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 on to verse 20. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of, the, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And right here, and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. Why was there not an help meet for him? Okay? Because animals don't have souls. 
okay? And perverts out there will come to this and say, well, Adam, never mind, okay? Perverts will come to this verse and twist it to justify horrendous, grotesque sin, okay? But there was not a help meet for Adam. Now, of course, this is where woman is created. Woman, because she was taken out of man, that's what woman means, okay? But a help meet for Adam. Why was there not a help meet for them, for Adam? Because cattle and creatures and every living thing didn't have a soul. Hence, now the help meet for man. Okay? That's why. That's why the blood and bulls of goats could only cover sin. Why? Because no soul. By man came sin. And by man, God as man. God as man. You scoundrel, scumbag, Jesuit coadjutor devils who like to cut and paste and twist people's words around. Okay? You guys are the ones who worship flesh. Not we of the church of the living God. Okay? God as man. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh. Okay? Okay? Okay. Now, go to Psalm... Uh, we already read Psalm 50. But we'll, let's read it again in the order that the Lord gave this to me to share with you. Okay? Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Verses 21 on to verse 23. Again. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I shew the salvation of God. And let's remember too, brethren, Let's remember too, uh, and thank you, dear brother, for this addition. Let's remember this. Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44, just one verse. Verse 6. Okay? Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Just one verse. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. In the beginning, God. And the Spirit moved across the water. And God said, God, who walked in the garden, the beginning. And in the end, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay? Yes. Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Reference unto Jesus Christ. Okay? I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Singular. One God. Comprised of spirits. Okay? Okay? Are you with me so far? Now go, uh, uh, we already read verses, uh, 1 Peter chapter 18, under verse 21. Okay, we were supposed to we were supposed to break that up. That's why. But now go to Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians. Okay, we already covered First Peter chapter one. It was supposed to be what we read first, uh, twenty one under verse twenty five. Then we were to go. Well, we'll go back there again. Why not? Okay, repetition is good. First Peter chapter one. Okay, verses eighteen under verse twenty one. Okay, let's read it. Let's refresh our memory. What we already read. Okay. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. And true, you got to remember, these coadjutors can only make it for about 10, 15 minutes. And then they get irritated because they are, they are natural. They're not, they don't have the Spirit of God in them. There's only so much that the false and the coadjutor can take. It's only the highly trained Jesuit uh, coadjutors such as the uh, Inquisitor from Queens, New York, who can watch these videos because he's well trained by the Jesuits, 
by the one guy and not the little boy like the one guy in Canada who can watch these videos from beginning to end. Well trained, okay? But most of these coadjutors, they cannot handle so much. So let's continue. Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Hmm. Very interesting. And let's go, of course, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Just one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Jesus Christ never sinned. But what you people have to understand, this, this, the skin suit, was and is capable of sin. God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Could not sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. I have never, ever said or taught that Jesus Christ sinned. I have never said that. Anyone who says that of me is a liar. Okay? Specifically to and that little punk from Indianapolis that lives by Notre Dame. That little punk. I never said that Jesus Christ sinned. Never. That is blasphemy. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay? Now, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And if you're, if you're lost and you've made it this far, here's where I'm going to lose you. Here's where I'm going to look. Here's where we, the church of the living God, who have the spirit of God, who guides us into all truth. Here's where we're going to lose you. Here, like the Jews who were listening to Paul, they gave audience unto him until he spake this word. And he said, away with such a fellow. Here's where we're going to lose you. Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 on to verse 28. See, the body was the vessel. The blood of that body, of a vessel that never sinned because God was within that vessel. Yes. Hence, the precious blood of Christ. This is what we're touching on. But see, people today, because of Catholicism, worship this. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, which is describing the spiritual climate before the time of Jacob's trouble which is the time of Jacob's trouble. I did that because we, the Church of the Living God, the redemption of the purchased possession, get redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 23 is referring to the spiritual climate before the time of Jacob's uh, trouble. Matthew chapter 24 is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 25 is talking about when our Lord Jesus Christ comes back with us, who go up with him, come back with him, okay? Uh, uh, okay, at the second coming, that's talking about when he comes back and he begins to establish the kingdom heaven. Okay? You with me? But, Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 on to verse 28. Okay? Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Okay? Now, the temple under the Old Testament was where God would come and meet with the high priest, especially on Yom Kippur, once a year, okay? But the temple under the Old Testament, before this dispensation, was where people would go, the Jews would go to worship God, because that was his house on earth that he would come and stuff like that, okay? That was the purpose of the temple. So, under the law, the temple was the holy place, okay? But see... Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold 
or the temple that sanctifieth gold. The temple that sanctifieth the gold. Roll that around for your head in your head a little bit. Okay? Oh, hold on. Don't get ahead of me. Let's continue. Okay? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth, upon, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. Okay, what are we, uh, we are reading on the verse 28, excuse me, okay? And whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. Now see, dwelleth therein. Who would dwell in the temple in the Old Testament? Hmm? Hmm? See, you got to rightly divide the uh, word of truth. Under the Old Testament, God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit, who is the Holy Ghost, okay? The Lord is that Spirit, okay? Thank you, pardon for my tongue tying, okay? But, under the dispensation of the law, God was not a permanent resident in anybody. The Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit, God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, God could come and go as seemed fit, okay? There was no seal until the day of redemption under the law. Okay? Hence, under the law, they had a temple, a physical temple, which were the shadow of things to come. We're, we're, we're going to look at that. Don't you worry. We're going to look at that. Okay? Which was a shadow of things to come. Okay? So, today, in this dispensation, okay? As you all know, you heretics out there, even you, and you, even you of the Church of the Living God, well, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which dwells within you. So what makes that temple holy, separate, other? You who are saved, you get exactly what I'm saying. You who are lost, you guys who work for the Vatican, you're gone. You don't get this because you are spiritually discerned. Okay? Let's continue. Okay? Verse 22, And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and, and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith, these ought ye, have to, have, these ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a net and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extor extortion and excess. Stop. They were swearing by the gold that was upon the altar. But on the inside, they are full of what? Extortion and excess. This was under the dispensation of the law. Okay? For our instruction in righteousness. How many people worship and glorify flesh, but within they don't have the Holy Ghost? Do you get it? Do you get it? Hmm? They, they, they worship their accomplishments. They boast their accomplishments. They boast their flesh. They boast of other men. They boast, I'm a disciple. I'm an it. Keep reading. Verse 26. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, like Satan, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Now, 
Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Just one verse. Isaiah chapter 42. One verse. Verse 21. See, man cannot keep the law. There is no such thing as sinless perfection in this life. John chapter, first John chapter 4, you say, right? That's talking about the Holy Ghost that dwells within you. Okay? Read Romans chapter 7 sometimes, dear friend. Okay? Paul, the greatest of the church of the living God, could not cease from sin. We sin every day. And see, you've got these heretics out there. Well, I don't sin every day. Oh, so for a day you're perfect like God. Heresy. The Lord rebuke you. Okay? But, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 21. Yeah, just one verse. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness' sake. Why? He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Ooh. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Do you get this so far, brother, sister? You lost people. You know, you lost people who have devils appear to you. See devils. You see dead people. Yeah, you see devils. Huh? You coagulators, you don't get this. You, you, law, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, I mean, I'm specifically tar, uh, talking about, you know, those coadjutor devils. But you're lost and don't understand this? It's okay. I'm talking about the ones who are here to make trouble. Okay? Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Verses 8 on to verse 10. Hebrews chapter 9. Verses 8 on to verse 10. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Talking about the actual physical temple. Okay? Which was a figure for the time then present, the dispensation under the law, okay? In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances, carnal, fleshly, okay, ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Not the Protestant Reformation. And what time would that be? When Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? Okay? See, man in his best state Man at his greatest. We as man. We can never keep the law perfectly. Never. Never. It's impossible. You cannot keep the law. No matter how hard you try. You could never do it. We've talked about that in length. Let's see. God. Manifest in flesh. Having flesh that was tempted, that could sin, but God within that flesh, the Word that was made flesh, God within that flesh could not sin, but while this can. Like I said to you at the beginning, have you not figured it out already that your flesh has a mind of its own? So, God manifests in flesh. Who made the law honorable. How did he make it honorable? He never sinned. He kept the law, the Ten Commandments, perfectly. That's why when the Bible say that uh, you're in sin if you get angry, but the scriptures say yeah, it's uh, angry without a cause. So the Bible say when Jesus got angry, he was a sinner. Okay? And see, because Christ made the law honorable and never sinned, that's why his body 
And that blood was the perfect sacrifice for sin. Man cannot do that. Man, we cannot do that. We, as the church of the living God, who have God within us, we cannot do that. Why? Because we are not God. Oh, we can know what is good is good or evil. Yeah. Yes. We can be as gods, knowing good and evil. But only God truly knows what is good and evil, you see. Okay? But God, within flesh, who could keep the law perfectly, and because He kept the law perfectly and made it honorable, hence, the body of Jesus Christ. Because of God, who is in that body, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The Word made flesh. That flesh was sanctified by God who kept the commandments perfectly. Do you understand finally? I hope you do. Okay? But uh, John chapter 16. John chapter... See, you, you can try to twist this all you want, dear friend from Blackpool and your little boyfriend, you can try to twist this all you want. Deal with the scriptures. Not saying that uh, you are a God. No. Because God within us, I mean, look at Paul. Look at Paul. Romans chapter 7. He And in his sarcasm, he said, uh, yeah, uh, and I think I have the Spirit of God. Yes. 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 Paul still sinned. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See, Jesus did what no man could do. He didn't, he didn't sin. He could not be tempted to sin by the flesh. You and I as man, who were made from dirt, which our flesh is made of. God within us doesn't force us to do what he says. Satan, who is against us, doesn't force us to go after it. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verses 7 and verse 13. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. See, while Jesus Christ is on the earth, okay, the Godhead, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the Father who is the soul, the Spirit which is the Holy Ghost, and the Word made flesh. These three are one, Spirit, soul, and body. God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. The soul is God the Father. The Spirit is the Holy Ghost. The Word made flesh is the body. Okay? And while Jesus Christ is present on the earth, the Holy Ghost wasn't given among men, was it? No, under the dispensation of the law, could come and go, come and go. It wasn't his permanent resident. So see, while he was on the earth, if, well, as long as he is on the earth, the Holy Ghost is not a permanent resident. During the kingdom of heaven, it's all works. Yeah. Why? Because Jesus Christ is going to, that's east. Because Jesus Christ is going to be physically on the earth at Jerusalem. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? I hope you do. Please tell me you do. Okay? Let's, let's continue. Okay? And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. And ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will shew you things to come. And you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 specifically, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and the Lord is that. Okay? 
Okay? So while Christ was on the earth, the Comforter was, would not be given. Why? Because he hadn't died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures yet to fulfill the law. And when he is back on earth, <laughs> kingdom of heaven, it's all works. And when Satan is loosed from his prison after the thousand years and sin is finally done away with, the final and seventh dispensation, no more sin. Now, go and, and now right here, go to 1 Corinthians as what we've been talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Okay? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth within you? Now, what, what makes the temple? The temple itself or he who dwells within the temple? We just looked at it. Does that mean that we are sinless? <laughs> God forbid. No. No. But your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost if you are truly saved. And verse 16. Right, verse, uh, verse 7. Let's read verse 16 again. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man, including yourself, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, set apart, which temple ye are. That does not mean that we are sinlessly perfect. But because God dwells within you, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You are holy. But yet, we sin every day. There are those of you of the church of the living God who smoke cigarettes. You are defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that's going to be your death. There are those of you of the church of the living God who get drunk. You are defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost. There are those of you who are of the church of the living God who are fornicating. You are defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and on that, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. See, the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or without spot. Christ kept the law perfectly. He made it honorable. Hence, when he died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, because even though the flesh itself was sinful, he never sinned. He never defiled it. And because he lived perfectly and never sinned, hence, he was the perfect sacrifice for sin, something that no man could ever do. Do you understand? Do you understand? And, and and go back to Matthew chapter 23. Okay? Go back. Do you do you do you get this? Please tell me you do. This this is very simple. This is this is extraordinarily simple. It's right here. It's right here. Okay? Well uh, Matthew chapter 23. <coughs> yeah. Uh, where is that? Uh, verse 17. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And salvation is a gift. Okay? Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This was in the Old Testament under the law. But the gift of salvation, the gift of God, which is Christ Jesus crucified. Okay? Okay? You get it? Okay? Alright? So, what made what made the sacrifice perfect? God within that flesh. But yet, that flesh was still sinful. Capable of sin. 
Because Jesus Christ knows exactly everything that you and I go through and deal with. Everything. But yet, he never sinned. God, as man, knows what it's like to have to deal with sin. But yet, he was never tempted to do sin. Why? Because God cannot sin. The flesh was of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, was capable of sin. But because Jesus never sinned once, in thought, in word, in deed, never once, hence, because of that, the body was sanctified. And that's something that we cannot do. Okay? While, and the, and the scriptures plainly declare that the flesh is sinful. But God within that flesh, your, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Do you understand? Do you understand? The flesh profiteth nothing. Okay? The flesh profiteth nothing. Jesus Christ himself said that. Okay? We read Romans chapter 2. Made in the likeness of sinful flesh. The flesh is sinful. But God within that flesh who never sinned on his death. That's why his blood was pure. Why? Because it was never tainted for sin. Even though the flesh itself is sinful. Do you understand? Okay. I hope you do. I hope you do. Now go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Okay. Isaiah chapter 53. If you don't understand this, this is fine. I don't expect any of you lost coadjutor devils to understand. I don't. But you are of the church of the living God who has the Lord within you, He will lead you and guide you into all truth. Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And we already covered this. Yeah. Yeah. But Satan, who is transformed into an angel of light, that light reflecting all those precious stones made to look oh so beautiful. The Roman Catholic Jesus, the effeminate looking Roman Catholic Jesus. Oh, he looks so beautiful, doesn't he? But the true Christ of the scriptures, the true anointed one of the scriptures, He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yeah. Because God within flesh lived as man and beheld all the trappings of that you and I deal with. So, he was acquainted with grief and a man of sorrows. Vexed it with the filthy conversation of the wicked every day. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we... Like sheep have gone astray. We have turned aside. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted. Because of what I did to him. He bare my iniquity. He bare my sins. On that cross. My fault. I put Jesus Christ on the cross. I put the nails in his head. I put the crown of thorns upon his head. I spat on him. It was my fault. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, 
And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Wouldn't have done anything anyway, would it? He says himself, if I say this, will you let me go? No. There's no reasoning with people like that. There are come like the Pharisees. If he would have come down from the cross, thank you, brother. Even if he would have come down from the cross in the hallelujah ha, and come down, they still wouldn't have believed. They would have they would have said, Oh, that's that's uh he does that by the power of Beelzebub. <laughs> Just like these coadjutors who no matter what kind of truth you give them, they've made their choice. Okay? So yeah, he didn't open his mouth. It wouldn't have done any good. They wouldn't have let him go. He was appointed to die. And when you come across someone who has made their choice, who is serving Satan and going to hell, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, not at gunpoint, but made their choice, I know a lot of you have a, pro a lot of problem with that. I know you do. I know you do. Let's continue. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? And what was his generation? <laughs> a wicked generation. What is our generation? Okay. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. Was he stricken? My people. Salvation is of the Jews. He was not sent yet uh, but unto the lost sheep of Israel. To the Jew first. And also to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile. Okay? See, for the transgression of my people is he stricken. For the transgression of my, me. My people. Man. For our instruction in righteousness today. It's personal, Jack. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he hath, because he had more, done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Never sinned. Never sinned. Okay? Yet, right here, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when he shall make his soul an offering for sin? He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. His soul. An offering for sin. But it was, we read in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, God shall provide himself a lamb. But it says here, his soul. You, you really start to have a big problem if you're a Trinitarian with this. Because what do Trinitarians teach? Three gods. It was God the Son. Not God the Father on the cross. It was God the Son. Hmm. Let's keep reading. He shall see the travail of of his soul. There it is again. And he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his, out his soul. Third time. Okay. On to death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. His soul. See, if you're a Trinitarian, you got a really big problem there. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 on to verse 38. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter, and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. 
Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now, now, the scriptures plainly declare in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? A person, never mind sick mind Freud, never mind your Google searches. Search here. A person is a spirit, soul, and body. It is satanic heresy to say that God is three persons. The scriptures never say God in three persons. That is heresy. The Trinitarian says three gods make one because a person is a spirit, soul, and body. So Christ on the cross according to the Trinitarian was not fully God because he was just the second part of the three person satanic, satanic trinity. But see, the Godhead is spirit, soul, and body. God, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So, okay, we have the Word made flesh on the cross. But yet, his soul was exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And we just look in Isaiah chapter 53. He shall see the anguish of his soul. Now, see, you would say, well, 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 wait. How can the Father be in Christ and yet be in heaven? In heaven? Great is the mystery of godliness. See, See, there again, there again, dear friend, your problem. You worship flesh. Here's your problem again. Uh, Psalm 50, here's your problem. Great is the mystery of godliness. God is a lot bigger than you, dear friend. Here's your problem. Isaiah 50, verse 21. These things have, uh, hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. How can God, who is vast, who is bigger than anything we can, our finite minds can imagine, how can God be in heaven yet be on a cross? Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay? But his soul, the Godhead, spirit, soul, and body. The soul, you know where Jesus says, my father. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Come on. John chapter 14. Verses 10 under verse 14. John chapter 14 verses 10 under verse 14. Okay. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? How so? The soul. We are made in the image of God. We have a spirit, soul, and body. The Word, okay? The Word was made flesh. That's the body. The Father in Him. The soul. Okay? Don't worry. We're, getting, we're going to be getting to the spirit. Okay? Let's continue. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father dwelleth, but that dwelleth, but the Father, excuse me, that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God, and God dwells within you? The Lord is that Spirit, God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake, which they did, which you don't, you heretics. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. It's expedient for him to go away, because if he didn't go away, the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that Spirit wouldn't come and be a permanent seal, permanent dwelling within you. Do you get it? Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay? okay. You know what he said? Uh, my Father is greater than I? The soul is greater. Yes, that's what he's talking about. Okay? That's what he's talking about. God the Father, the soul of the Godhead, the Word made flesh is the body. And the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. Do you understand? So, on the cross, the Word made flesh, the body. His soul, an offering for sin. Okay? Soul that was in the body, the Godhead. Okay? You get it? Okay? Uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 27 under verse 36. Okay? Verses 27 under verse 36. Okay? And this right here again, um, right here, is a reference onto Psalm 16. Okay? But Acts chapter 2, verses 27 under verse 36. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy and joy with thy countenance. Countenance, referring unto the bodily thing. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ, the anointed one, to sit on his throne as the son of David. Yes. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, the price of our sin was paid on the cross, not in hell. Okay? Not in hell. Okay? By his stripes we are he healed. The blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. Okay? But why did he go down to hell? We'll get to that. Okay? But heretics like Steve Anderson teach that the price for our sin was paid in hell. Heresy! Heresy! No! The death Burial and resurrection, the blood shed on the cross. The cross, the cross, the cross, on the cross. That's where the penalty for sin was paid, not in hell. That's heresy. That's wicked heresy. Let's continue. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus and corruption because three days. And remember Lazarus? It was four days and they said by then he stinketh. There's some scientific uh, evidence of the scriptures for you. A body doesn't start to stink after when? Four days. You atheists out there as the one who has... Yes, that's scientifically true. Unless, you know, under bizarre, bizarre conditions. But... Four days. After after three days, fourth day, the body stinketh, beginning to corrupt. Okay, let's continue. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear, of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And the Lord could not have given the Holy Ghost as a permanent resident while on earth. 
because the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Do you get it? That's why during the kingdom of heaven it's all works. Because Jesus, he's going to be on the throne. Okay? Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into, he into the heavens, but he, saith, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Where, uh, where therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ. Christ means anointed one. Jesus, Jehovah saves. Christ, the anointed one. Okay? Okay? And of course, like I said, that was he, that he was uh, Peter was referencing Psalm 16. Go there very quickly. Just uh, we're going to read Psalm 16 verses 8 unto verse 11. Scripture with scripture. See what is being quoted. Okay, come on, fingers work with me. Psalm 16. Psalm 16 verses 8 unto verse 11. I have set the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt shew me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The pleasure, the gift of God, which is Christ Jesus and him crucified. Our salvation by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Therefore, we will rejoice. Okay? Okay? And, and now go to First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Verses 8 on to verse 20. Uh, 18, excuse me. Verses 18 on to verse 20. In 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the capital S, Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, huh. which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited, waited in the days of Noah, where while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And check this out. Um, in uh, verse twenty, with Hebrews, verse uh, Hebrews chapter nine, verse eight. Okay, denoting the difference in the dispensation. Hebrews chapter nine. Verse 8, For the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiness of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. And you look at verse 20, Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Referring on to, to the typology of the, the ark of uh, Noah, a type of Christ. People would go into the ark and would be saved from the flood, the wrath and judgment of God. Okay? See that? See that? He's mentioning, and then he makes the mention about how baptism doth save us, which Martin Luther gets wrong, saying that water baptism was necessary for salvation. When Peter says specifically, uh, 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 where is that? The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but of but the answer of a good conscience towards God toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See. See, he's making a reference 
unto how it was in a previous dispensation and making and using the Ark of Noah as a type of Christ that was in a different dispensation. See? Okay? And water, water baptism does not wash away the filth of the flesh. It's the answer of a good conscience. It is an outward profession of an inner conversion. Why? Because the flesh, Romans chapter 7, the flesh cannot be made perfect. Okay? The flesh cannot be made perfect. It is through your flesh you sin. That's why water baptism does not save us. And even Martin Luther, your boy, got it wrong. Okay? You with me on that so far? Okay? Now, go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Went to hell. And heretics like uh, Steve Anderson and the like like that say that the price for our sin was paid in hell. Absolutely not. It was paid at the cross, not in hell. Okay? Uh, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. You know the story of Lazarus? Okay? He went to hell, but it said that he will not leave my soul in hell. Okay? What is that talking about? What is that talking about? Okay? And it said that he went and preached to the, uh, and let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 again. Okay, I, I left my place there. 1 Peter chapter 3 again. 1 Peter 3 again. What is that? Verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits, lowercase s, in prison. In prison. Waiting to be released to go into heaven. What are you talking about? Luke chapter 16, verses 19 unto the close of the chapter. There was a certain rich man which, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gates full of gate, full of souls, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, very quickly, it says that the angels came and carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Into. Doesn't say anything about how he was carried up into Abraham's bosom. Where was Abraham's bosom? Bosom in the earth. Move it to you. Absolutely. Hold your place there. First Samuel chapter 28. Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was where those before the perfect sacrifice for sins was made went to await the Lord to come. They were being held in a prison, so to speak. Uh, they were there waiting for the perfect sacrifice to be made, the death, burial, and resurrection. And then when he went down there he, uh, to, to the souls in prison, okay, the souls in prison, okay, he went down to the earth, okay, to the souls in prison, those in Abraham's bosom. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 28. Come on, fingers work with me. Verse 15. 1 Samuel 28, verse 15. Very telling. You know, the witch in Endor, and the Lord allowed this to happen. And Samuel said, uh, Samuel said to Saul, Samuel was already dead this by this time, and was in Abraham's bosom. Prove it? Okay. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Not to bring him down, but to bring me up. Was Samuel in hell? No. Where was he? He was in, in, he was in Abraham's bosom, which was in the heart of the earth. 
There was a dividing line between hell and Abraham's bosom. And those who were in Abraham's bosom, where Samuel was, were, it was said, they were in prison, waiting for Christ to pay for, this, uh, pay for the sins of the world with his death, burial, and resurrection, shedding his blood on the cross by keeping the law perfectly. Okay? They were in Abraham's bosom. Doesn't say, why have you brought me down? Meaning, coming down from heaven, brought up. You did tell me that Samuel went to hell and is not in heaven right now? Yes. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me? Disquieted. He was asleep. In rest, comforted, waiting. To bring me up. And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God has departed from me. And answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore have I called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. And then notice what Samuel says. Uh, where he says, uh, hold on, oh, I, I skipped, I skipped. <laughs> uh, uh, one second, I've got to find this. All right, and look at verse 19. More, and this is what Saul, uh, Samuel is saying to Saul. Moreover, the Lord also will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Now, he said he will be with me. I believe that's a reference dead in the heart of the earth. Now, was Saul, King Saul, with Samuel in Abraham's bosom? I don't know. I doubt that. I doubt that. But with me in the earth. Because there was a dividing line. Hell and Abraham's bosom. Okay? Back to Luke chapter 16. Okay? Verse 24. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy life time receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is tormented, but now he is comforted, excuse me, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they that pass to us that would come from thence. Note that language there. Pass, not ascend and descend. Meaning what? That they were on at the same place. I believe that Abraham's bosom was actually above while hell is lower, okay? And there was a great gulf. But see, there again, that would the language would be go up. But it says pass. Pass over. Okay? So when Saul, Samuel said to Saul, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me in the earth where Abraham's bosom was, where hell is, in the earth. And see, look at that verse. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from thence, side to side, so that they that would pass from thence, side to side, to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us, side to side, that would come from thence. Not up and down, side to side, same level, same place in the earth. Why was that? He went and preached to the souls that were in prison, the spirits that were in prison, lowercase s. Okay? Okay? You get it? They were in Abraham's bosom. All right? Waiting for the perfect sacrifice for sins to be made on the cross, not be paid in hell. So that he was like, hey, I'm here. Let's go. We're going. The way to heaven is open. Okay? Let's continue. In Luke chapter 16. Then he said, I pray thee, Father, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, 
that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they, would re they will repent. And he said unto them, And he said unto him, They hear not the Moses and the prophets. Otherwise, if they will not hear the scriptures, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Luke chapter 23 now. Luke chapter 23. Verses 39 on to verse 43. This, this brings up this. Paradise. People want to call Abraham's bosom paradise. Or that paradise is another name for heaven. You know the word paradise appears only three times in scripture? And look at what it's, what it's about. We're going to look at all these three occurrences. Look at Luke chapter 23. Verses 39 on to verse 43. The only time, the first time the word paradise appears. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, the anointed one, save thyself and us. And we already looked at if he would have come down from the cross, wouldn't have believed anyway. Even if he would have saved this guy the way he thinks, save his earth his earthly life. He who saves his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. Hence, paradise. Oh, sweet. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? See, the first thief, the first male factor, save thyself, save us. He was thinking of his earthly life. He was on the cross. He was going to die. See, this life, this life lived in the flesh. That's what the first thief, first male factor was all concerned about. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. But the other, I'm going to die. But where am I going to go? But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doth, Dost not thou fear God? Seeing that thou, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, verse forty-one, repentance, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. This man hath done nothing amiss. The other one just wanted to save his life. Get me down from the cross. I'm going to die. I don't want to die. The other, hey, we deserve to be here, and I'm going to die. What does he do? And he said unto him. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. In thy kingdom. The Bibles, by the way, mess up verse 42. Some take out Jesus, some take out Lord. And he said unto him, Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, Jesus went and pre preached to the spirits that were in prison in the earth. Okay? And I'll leave my soul in hell. Okay? So, Abraham's bosom could not have been paradise. It could not have been. Because he went to preach to the spirits that were in prison, being held, waiting for the perfect, uh, uh, perfect sacrifice for sins. So, Abraham's bosom could not have been paradise. Couldn't have been. Okay? Because Jesus didn't go down there and stay. He went there to preach. It's like, hey, I, I pay. This, this debt's paid. Let's go, guys. We're going. Okay? So paradise could not have been Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. 
another. Now, note, this was on the crucifixion. This was at the crucifixion. And he was about to die. Okay? Okay? Paradise, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay? Heaven is heaven. But, but notice, notice, and these people, and people make the same blunder with trying to say that liberty is actually charity. Okay? Look at verse 43. Don't look at me. Look at first. Look at the verse. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me. I am Alpha and Omega, first and the last. Lo, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Who is the blessed hope? Jesus Christ. Who is our charity? Jesus Christ. Who is our liberty? Jesus Christ. Who is our salvation? Jesus Christ. What's paradise? Thou shalt be with me. Paradise. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Chapter 12. I do not believe for one second that paradise is another name for heaven. No. No. I believe, and I believe this is what the scriptures are teaching, that paradise is actually being in the presence of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 and verse 4. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come in visions, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Three heavens. The sky the firmament, and the third heaven where God is. The third heaven. Do you see that? The third heaven. Okay? There's the sky that we see, the firmament, the dome, and then past that where God is, the third heaven. Okay? The scripture calls that the third heaven. I about this? Keep reading. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. To the third heaven. Caught up into paradise. Be with me in paradise. Was in Abraham's bosom. And heaven is heaven. It's not just another. I'm sure if we were to look that up in Webster's 1828 dictionary, I'm sure he would probably say paradise is another thing for heaven or another name for Abraham's bosom if he was that, if he was actually dispensational like that. I believe that the scripture is telling us, and Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The paradise of God. Caught up into paradise. Today you, thou shalt be, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. I believe scripture tells us that paradise itself is being with Jesus Christ. Is in presence of Jesus Christ. That's what I believe this is, the scripture is teaching. That paradise... Is it a state of mind? No. Is it Abraham's bosom? Can't be. Is it glibly another name for heaven? No. If it were, why were there only three appearances? No. No. Paradise has everything to do with Jesus Christ. 
everything to do with Jesus Christ. And my, what, 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 what does that say? In um, uh, Revelation, um, uh, uh, Revelation chapter uh, uh, 22, um, where, is his, uh, where does he say that? Uh, and behold, uh, verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, Revelation 22, verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be paradise is being with Jesus Christ. It's not Abraham's bosom. Can't be. It's not another name for heaven. I don't believe so. At the context that we have looked at, the three appearances of the word paradise, they all have to do with new uh, uh, with Jesus Christ, one when he was dying on the cross, one for this dispensation, and also one for the time of Jacob's trouble. Paradise is being with God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. That's paradise. That is paradise. Okay? Now, Let's go to Psalm 31. So, on the cross, we have the Word made flesh, the body on the cross, that was made, that was sanctified by God dwelling within that flesh who never sinned, though the flesh itself was capable of sin, corrupt. Sinful flesh, Romans declares it. Okay? The flesh was sinful itself. Yes, but God that kept the law and made it honorable, never sinned, couldn't be tempted to sin, made that flesh honorable, okay, on the cross. But yet the flesh itself was sinful, okay, because Satan's temptation was all aimed at the flesh of Jesus Christ. Not God, because he couldn't tempt, he tempt God, but he can tempt the flesh, okay? All flesh is sinful. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The Word was made flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh. You can't, you lost people, you can't understand that because you're lost and you worship the God of Catholicism. Okay? You can't understand that. When you save people, hopefully this will help you. Okay? But the Word made flesh on the cross. He died, buried, and rose again. The you know died, buried, and rose again. Third day according to the scriptures. Who did that? God. God. God did. And who is God? God is what? Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So, on the cross, who was on the cross? God was on the cross. The Godhead was on the cross. God himself, a lamb, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Psalm 31, spirit. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. Lord Kesar on these rock references. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Amen. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me. For thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. And Psalm 22, verse 1. Psalm 22, verse 1. Psalm 22, verse 1. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That's only part of it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my glory? Luke chapter 23, verse uh, 14. Okay. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. 
Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Okay? Got a video on this, which will be in the description box, where he says, Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And when he and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. My spirit. And that's what Lord says. Hmm. Hmm. Now go to Mark chapter 15. Thank you, brother. Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. So, who was on the cross? God. The Godhead. Who was on the cross? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Not God the Son. One of three of the gods of Satanism, Catholicism. No. God totally. Spirit, soul, and body. The Godhead was on the cross. See, you Trinitarians have a problem. You believe in three gods. That made one, one God. So, according to you Trinitarians, your demigod, who is not God the Father, and you will behead people for saying, Jesus is not the Father. But yet, Jesus declared himself to be the Father. See, you Trinitarians, you say, God the Son was on the cross. You are still in your sins. Because you do not believe that I am He. Because you vehemently deny that Jesus is the Father. When Jesus himself said he was the Father. Soul of the Godhead. So who is on the cross? God. Who is God? Spirit, soul, and body. You see. And you Trinitarians saying that God the Son was on the cross? You're still in your sins. You're still in your sins. Because you do not believe that Jesus is He. You do not believe that Jesus is God the Father. And you're tainted because of Catholicism. The Trinity is satanic. If total God, the Godhead, if God was not the one who was on the cross, and you do not believe that Jesus is was He, is He, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That Jesus is the Father. Which you Trinitarians don't. Then who died on the cross? The second, par the second part of your satanic little trinity. The beast. Which you're going to see. When you go through the great tribulation. See you Trinitarians. You've got a really big problem. You do. Mark chapter 15. Thank you, brother, for your advice on this. Mark chapter 15, verses 29 under verse 37. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. And even if he would have done that, these people wouldn't have believed it. They would have said he does it by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Okay? Let's continue. Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, uh, mocking, said, uh, said among themselves with the scribes, he, with the scribes, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Show me something. And like I said, if he had done that, he does that by the power of Beelzebub. There was no getting through to these people. There are certain people that there's no getting through to. Even if Christ were to descend from the cross right in front of them, they would, have, would still not get it. There are those out there, brethren, 
who have crossed that line. I know of quite a few of them, unfortunately, who have gone. They're serving Satan. They're going to hell. They know it, and they preach another Jesus. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which is a reference on Psalm 22, verse 1. Not the whole verse, but part of it. Which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who cried that on the cross? God did. Total, complete, holy God. Holy God, Spirit, Soul, and Body, the Godhead, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God who knows all things, knows. And see, you as the church of the living God, that ought to be a source of comfort unto you. Because remember, the, chief, the first uh, male factor, the first thief, save me! Fear Christ! I don't want to die! But the other... I deserve this. Lord, you are my only hope. I deserve this. And I'm getting less than I deserve. Please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, Lord, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. What's our Lord say? This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. What do you have to fear of death? Because you will be in paradise. And what is paradise? Being with the Lord Jesus Christ. In heaven. God knew what it, knows what it's like to taste and face death as man. But, you know, but don't be discouraged. He has overcome the world. O oh, death, where is thy uh, plagues? O oh, grave, where is thy sting? Or whatever that is. Pick your part. That ought to be a source of comfort for you. God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that Spirit, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God knows exactly what it feels like for you to die, for me to die. Hence, we need fear. Because he has conquered death, hasn't he? But you're a Trinitarian. You're a Trinitarian? The God that you believe in is not the God of the Scriptures, but the God of Catholicism. Satan. What hope do you have? Verse 35. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let us alone. Let us see whether Elias will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. It was expedient for him to go away. Because unless he had gone away, the Holy Ghost wouldn't be able to be freely given to those who come to him on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, call upon his name. Do you see? The Old Testament. The Holy Ghost wasn't a whole it wasn't a permanent resident. Could come and go. You read that constantly. The Spirit of the Lord left them, left Samson, left Hezekiah. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Uh, Psalm fifty one. Okay? Different dispensation. You understand? Okay? Oh, but that's me being prideful, huh? By the way, you're wicked. You need to repent. Tell that ghost to get a haircut, boy. Psalm 139. This thing about the Spirit. So, the Word made flesh on the cross. The soul, the anguish of his soul... Spirit 
the soul of the Godhead, the spirit. Who is on the cross? God. Totally, completely, perfect God. Spirit, soul, and body. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God shall, God shall provide himself a lamb who was on the cross. God was. God was. You Trinitarians believe in three gods. Three persons make one God. And when someone says to you, Jesus Christ is the Father, how do you react? <laughs> you look at that satanic image of the satanic trinity with the two round things and the one on the bottom. That's a picture of the female matrix. It's a sex symbol. You Trinitarians... You don't believe in God as he actually is. Because you say, the one in the middle died for me. No. God, manifest in the flesh, died on the cross. God himself was on that cross. God himself went and took and called the spirits out of prison. The Godhead, spirit, soul, and body was on the cross. Not your pagan, satanic, second member of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity. No. You Trinitarian, you believe that, you ain't saved. You're not saved. Because you have demoted Jesus Christ to a second place God. Prove it. I can prove it. Jesus is the Father. How do you react? Jesus is not the Father. Ready to cut my head off, just like the Catholics. Just like the Catholics. Okay. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Okay. Psalm 139. About the Spirit. Verse 7 on verse 12. Psalm 139. Verses 7 on verse 12. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Where are you going to go to get away from God? See, Catholics tell you uh, hell is being separated from God. Really? Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? See, again, you Trinitarians and you heretics who worship flesh, you think, you think God is one like you. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. This is showing us how big God is, and how you heretics and devils Make God so small as to make him one such as yourself. Your problem. Okay? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Hell is being separated from God. Uh, you read about how uh, people are going to be tormented in the presence of God, of the Lamb, and the holy angels. Okay? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely dark, the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Where are you going to go to hide from God? Where are you going to go? Well, you think God doesn't see you? You think God doesn't know what you're doing? What, what hope do you have unless your hope is in Jesus Christ? Your hope and trust and faith is on Jesus Christ. What hope do you have? Who, what else is there? 
the self and the flesh that Satan is so willing to give you and offer you. If you fall down and worship me, all will be thine. Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. Come on, fingers. We're, we're almost done. This is not going to be a three and a half hour video. I promise you. Okay. I know my, uh, our, my best friend was like, hey, it is what it is. Three and a half hours was a long video. But Amos chapter 9, verses 2 1 to verse 10. Though they dig into hell, then shall my hand take them. Hell is not being separated from God, dear friend. Hell is you suffering God's judgment. And you read in the book of Revelation, the smoke of their torment goes up before the Lamb and His angels. You'll be tormented in the presence of the Lamb and of His angels forever and ever. Though they dig into hell, then shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, then shall I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt. And all that dwell therein shall mourn. And it shall rise up holy like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Syrians from Kir? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. I get away from it. And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth. Saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. And today, what is that sinful kingdom? That kingdom of the, the son of perdition that Roman Catholicism is building right now. For lo, I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Ye shall not Ye yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. John chapter 6. And we will be done. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 61 on to verse 65. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore, therefore said I unto you, and no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father and Acts chapter 20. Thank you, brother. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock 
over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you every one night and day with tears. So, who was on the cross? God was on the cross. The Godhead. The Godhead. God was on the cross. What is the Godhead? What is God? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. The Godhead was on the cross. The body, the flesh that the Word was manifest in. The flesh died. God was on the cross, yes. God died on the cross. Yes, God that was in that flesh. But who was the who was on that cross? God. So hence, God in flesh, God in sinful flesh, who kept the law perfectly and made it honorable, never sinned on his death was a perfect sacrifice because there was no sin in him, even though the flesh was able to sin. But God within that flesh could not sin. Hence, a perfect sacrifice. Hence, the perfect blood of God because only God could do it, not man at his best state. So who was on the cross? God was. Not the second member of a satanic trinity. Because see, you say that, you say that it was God the Son, the second person of the three-person satanic trinity. You're still in your sins. You're not saved. Why? Because according to you Trinitarians, Jesus is not the Father. And you will cut off anyone's head who comes around saying that Jesus is the Father. And Jesus himself said he was the Father. So what, are you going to cut off his head too? That's going to be it for this video. Oh, I know this is going to stir up a whole bunch of you scumbag, coadjutor devils who are useless and meaningless. I know it. But I, that's, it comes with the territory. It comes with the territory. I hope this has helped some of you. And I hope this has also helped some of you to recognize and realize that the Trinity is truly satanic. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And we are made in the image of God. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. Spirit, soul, and body, the person, was on that cross. Who is God? Who is God? Not the second member of a third member trinity. Holy God was on that cross. And Holy God died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scripture. So, that's going to be it for this, uh, for this video. Um, any questions, go ahead and get a hold of me. Uh, you send me offensive emails, uh, even if you want to hide who uh, your email address, even though I know who you are, who would send them through what is that gorilla thing, uh, I'm still going to expose you for your wicked email, just so you know. So, so you know. Hopefully this will help some of you. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. Thank you for your prayers. We love you. Thank you, brethren, and we will see you in the next video.